Now, you didn't think you'd sit through an address from a psychiatrist and not hear something about fantasies and dreams, did you? <laughs> but the great thing about psychiatrists is that we can talk about dreams and fantasies as well as the hippocampus and the cytochrome P450 system. <laughs> Dr. Patrice Harris made history in 2019, becoming the first black woman elected as president of the American Medical Association. A child psychiatrist, Harris completed her residency at the Emory University School of Medicine. She is a former county public health director and a devoted patient advocate. Harris led the AMA's charge to end the horrific opioid epidemic. She has chaired the Opioid Task Force since 2014. A renowned expert on children's mental health and childhood trauma, Dr. Harris used her platform to shed light on the importance of getting help for depression and anxiety while bringing attention to health disparities during the COVID-19 crisis. I'm Phyllis Jackson. The Legacy Lives. Carolyn Long Banks is the first black woman to be appointed and elected to the Atlanta City Council. An important part of Atlanta history, Banks was among a group of Atlanta University students forming the Committee on the Appeal for Human Rights. Known as the Atlanta Student Movement, Banks and others committed to nonviolence, took part in sit-ins at local segregated lunch counters and cafeterias in the Georgia State Capitol, as well as area restaurants that turned black patrons away. Their courageous acts would open the doors to desegregation of Atlanta's businesses, schools, and medical facilities. Carolyn Long Banks served the city of Atlanta from 1980 to 1997. I'm Atlanta City Council member Amir Faroqi. The legacy lives. Marvin Stevens Arrington Sr. made an unforgettable mark on the city of Atlanta. He was elected to the Atlanta Board of Aldermen in 1969. The name of that legislative body was changed to the Atlanta City Council in 1974. Arrington served as council president for 17 years. Among many other important causes, Arrington fought diligently to address issues of discrimination and led the charge to require the recording of all standing committee meetings and city council meetings. He also courageously appointed a woman to chair the finance committee. After stepping down from the council, his service to the city continued. In 2002, Governor Roy Barnes appointed Arrington to become Fulton County Superior Court Judge, where he served for 10 years before retiring. Arrington's dedication and commitment to serve would not go unnoticed. In 2019, the Atlanta City Council voted unanimously to rename the council chamber in his honor. I am Atlanta City Council President Felicia Moore. The legacy lives. Welcome to this edition of State Home Connect. I'm Phyllis Jackson. While promoting his COVID-19 relief plan, President Biden says that 600 million doses of the coronavirus vaccine will be available by the end of July. FEMA launches the opening of its first COVID-19 vaccination sites in Los Angeles and Oakland as part of the Biden administration's plan to pick up the pace of vaccine distribution. The winter weather is hindering vaccination efforts in many states, including here in Georgia. In a release, the Georgia Department of Public Health says it received notice from the CDC that Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that should have arrived earlier this week were held back by the manufacturers due to the weather. Delays are expected to continue through the week Many providers are rescheduling appointments. Officials with the Department of Public Health are asking for patience as they wait for weather conditions to improve and shipments to resume. 
Doctors are concerned about an increase of an extremely rare multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children after exposure to COVID-19. The condition leads to inflammation of the body's major organs. Here's what you need to know. The CDC has a list of symptoms that you should be aware of. Not all children will have the same symptoms. Among the more serious, troubled breathing, chest pain, or pressure that doesn't go away, along with severe abdominal pain. For a full list of symptoms of multi-system inflammatory syndrome, you can go to the CDC's website at cdc.gov. That's a wrap. We'll see you on the next edition of Stay at Home Connect. Good afternoon. This is Council Member Shepard, and we will officially call the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee to order today, February the 22nd. So sad I'm the chair. Ms. Lindo, are you there? And if so, can we do a roll call? Yes, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. We have Council Member Dustin Hillis. Council Member Cara Smith? Here. Council Member Michael Julian Bond? Here. Council Member Mayor Faroki? Here. Council Member Andrea Boone? Present.
Council Member Winslow. Mr. Hillis? Yes, this is Council Member Hillis, I'm present. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, we have six members present in the quorum. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. Uh, we will now, can you read the, the remote meeting statement, Ms. Lindo? Yes, Madam Chair, good afternoon. Today's Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee meeting will be conducted remotely as advertised and in accordance with the Georgia Code Section 50-14-1. The meeting will be conducted in conformance with Robert Rules of Order and the Rules of Council as authorized by the City Code. The public may access the meeting conference bridge toll free by dialing 877-579-6743 and entering conference ID number 831 599-1256. This information was also provided on the Friday, February 19th, 2021 public meeting notice. The public may also view the meeting on Channel 26, the Council's homepage at citycouncil.atlanta.ga.gov, Facebook and Twitter pages at ATL Council, and the Council's YouTube channel. All presentations are available on the Atlanta City Council website on the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee Presentations page. Today's meeting agenda was also published and made available on Friday, February 19th via the City's website at atlantacityga.iqm2.com. In addition, the public was able to submit comments via voicemail at 404-330-6022 yesterday between the hours of 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. These comments will be played during the public comment portion of this meeting. All persons present on the remote council meeting conference bridge are requested to mute your phones and speakers. Meeting participants wishing to speak must be acknowledged by the committee chair. Amendments, substitutes, presentations, and other informational documents have been distributed to committee members beforehand. Thank you all in advance for your cooperation. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We will now move to the adoption of the agenda, and I will entertain a motion. There are no changes that I have before me for the agenda, so I can get a motion to approve the agenda, please. So moved, Hillis. Thank you. Second. Mr. Bond, thank you, Mr. Bond. For the motion and a second, we're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. The vote is open. The vote is closed, 68 there are nays. The uh, agenda has been adopted. Um, Madam Chair, I've also been informed that Council President Felicia Moore is on the call. Thank you, I appreciate that. Welcome, President Moore. We're now at the approval of the minutes. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved, Hillis. Back up. Thank you, Mr. Bond and Mr. Hillis. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. The vote is open, Madam Chair. The vote is closed, six days, zero nays. The meeting minutes have been approved. We're now at public comments. I believe we have three comments. Ms. Lindo, we're ready for public comment. One moment, Madam Chair. Greetings to you, council members and staff, and special greetings to you, citizens of Atlanta, monitoring your government in action between now and Tuesday, November 2nd. Ken Howard, senior advocate, public policy analyst. The planning advisory, APAP planning advisory board, public safety committee will meet Thursday, February 25th at 7 p.m. Details about the meeting may be obtained by visiting the, the committee website www.safeatlanta.org. One may also call 311 and ask for APAB contact information. At the APAB meeting Saturday, the NPUR chair announced that he had received no notification of the APAB meeting. Ben Howard also indicated he had received no notice of the APAB meeting. However, Sherry Williams, a member of the NPUR 9, was present but made no complaints about not being informed. Reportedly also not being informed were those senior citizens who have gone to NPUR meetings and have been thwarted in their attempts to be placed on the NPUR agenda for just a few minutes. I call upon you, NPUR 9, to stop discriminating against senior citizens in 
members of the residence within the neighborhood planning unit are and along the Hamilton Road and Cascade Corridor. As Derek Postman once said to the Atlanta Board of Education, let the people speak. I say, stifle citizen participation no more, NTUR 9. Let the people speak at NTUR meetings, you Vice Chair Antonita Robinson, you Carlos Clare, you Ricardo Jacobs, you Alfred White, you Annette L. Scott, you Allison Hathaway, you Sherry Williams, and you NTUR 9 cohorts and supporters. I am from the state of Muhammad. I live in District 11, Miss Over Street, representation of our district. We have a problem with a neighbor on the street that I live on, Tail Road, Southwest Atlanta. The new paved road side with the sidewalks were initiated in 2010 by the help of Mr. Martin and members of the South of Atlanta. We have a neighbor at this particular moment that have a drain, a sewage drain, as you know and don't, don't know, we are not connected to the city of Atlanta. I've asked, but we are not connected. But this particular neighbor have a sewer really coming up out of the ground. And as it rains, it comes out of the ground and back down back of her home into a free forage stream from Canada Line Road all the way across Town Street Parkway into the pond. Drain during this pandemic. But the problem that we have today, police officers and police committed, is it's by a neighbor home next door is constantly draining onto the property. It is private property. It has been said, Ms. Keisha Lansbaum, that the city don't give a private property. But what about the police? Is there anything that you can do to aid and help of this neighbor to get some resolution with the problem? Or oh, is violating her constitutional rights, violating her state rights, violating her due process law rights, and all the due management rights that an individual has that is a human person? I'm a spiritual man, and I'm calling on this police to have the sensitivity to know that we are having people that are angry, that are arguing about wanting to fix the problem, find a way to get it fixed, so we don't have to continue to beg you. After 400 years, you kept us locked down and slaves, right here in Georgia, you treat us worse than you treat Calum, worse than you treat all the now in 2021, we can't even get you to stop the drainage of sewer, sewer race coming on to the property of a private resident who pays taxes to have water bill, to have tax bill, Fulton kind County of bill. So what can you do, police department? We're only asking you to find a way to use some of your influence and talk with the neighbors and talk with members of the hierarchy of the police department. You may have resources that you, you may have resources you can utilize to help aid this senior to get the property because during the pandemic, we should have to suffer like this. From the Anthony Muhammad, Mahat, Major Hotel, and Shane, and Shane, and Shane, to the ancestors. Dear not this spirit of Christ, my name is Henry Jordan. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devour the enemy. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Revelation 11, chapter 5, verse. They will perform miracles similar to those performed by Moses and Elijah. Jesus gave his prophets power to heal those who fight against them. Sam Montgomery, you ask for death when you fight against a prophet of God. The getting of pleasure by a lying tongue is a vanity called to and fro of them that seek death. Proverbs 24, chapter 6, verse. Therefore, they will experience destruction because they themselves will be deceived by their own teaching and continue to reject the way of truth. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to obey. Daniel 4, chapter 37, verse. Nebuchadnezzar praised and worshiped God for his power 
and his righteousness. So let not your heart be troubled. He believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, chapter 1, verse. Let not your heart be troubled, refers to Peter, Jesus, having told him of his imminent denial of his Lord. God may never take have to stay in the wilderness for 12 months. That's how he obeyed him and made him give honor to God. Let us willingly obey Jesus because he might have to obey us when we get, try to get bigger than God. Thank you and obey Jesus. Thank you. I believe that's the last of our comments. For now, at presentation, we have our first presentation by the Atlanta Police Department, and that's Deputy Chief Sherbaum. Are you there, Mr. Sherbaum? Ms. Lindo, is Mr. Sherbaum on the call? We're verifying that, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. This is Deputy Chief Sharon. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yes, good morning, ma'am. Uh, Council President Moore, members of the committee. Uh, Deputy Chief Sharon, I'm here on behalf of Interim Chief Rodney Bryant, the Atlanta Police Department bi weekly update. If we go to slide two, please, I want to start by uh, giving an overview of the department's effort to propel the street racing, uh, which you all know took off at um, large proportions at the beginning of COVID last year. On your chart, you will see that. Since October, we've had a steady decrease in the number of citizens that have been calling uh, 911 to report that activity. Uh, part of the efforts that have gone into to the drop has occurred has been the specialized units that we're deploying each week and weekend into the areas that we know the street racers uh, tend to gather and also intelligence tells us they may be going to uh, for that weekend. Uh, since October, those specialized units have conducted 3,117 traffic stops. Those traffic stops have resulted in 3,087 citations being issued, 81 physical arrests have occurred, and 133 vehicles have been impounded. Uh, note of those citations, 200 of those citations have been for loud exhaust, and 30 of those citations and arrests have been for individuals that have violated the new city ordinance 150-73 for organizing and participating uh, in a street racing event. Uh, the department will continue to deploy to those areas and continue to use the resources to make sure that we uh, get those try to put those occurrences below the, the COVID occurrence started last year. We'll go to the next slide, please. A snapshot of the current uh, crime numbers in the city. Uh, if you will notice, we're currently at approximately 2% uh, above where we were at this time last year. And I want to focus on three of those areas that tend to, to drive the crime. We go to the, the next slide. Focusing on aggravated assaults, uh, these these are occurring in, in multiple different areas. However, three of the the main occurrences are domestic violence, those are related to narcotics, and around clubs. Uh, we've been working very closely with our victims assistance and witness program uh, to ensure that any victim of a of an aggravated assault or domestic violence is connected to assistance. Uh, we're striving to ensure that we do not have any repeat victims or occurrences there that is occurring. Uh, from the time the officers are dispatched and then as we investigate the case. I also want to take note to thank members of the council uh, who provide us with tips of illegal narcotics dealing occurring in neighborhoods. Uh, those tips are very helpful. Uh, this year we have doubled the number of narcotics warrants that were served this time last year. Uh, that is a significant portion of our strategy as we work to address uh, aggravated assaults occurring in the neighborhoods. Uh, the deployment of our apex unit which is our proactive uh, violent crime unit into the neighborhoods with seeing an elevated occurrence of open air uh, their gun seizures are slightly above what they were this time last year uh, as well as the arrest of individuals in that area and i also want to note that the work of the uh, problem uh, properties task force around clubs they've been doing uh, to reduce uh, violent crimes in the area of our clubs next slide please our larceny, larceny from auto uh, the percentages have narrowed uh, to a slight increase over this time last year. Uh, the predominant number of those occurrences are in the downtown and midtown area. Uh, the department has deployed additional resources there, including additional footbeat, uh, new officers from our academy, 
Our special operations unit has deployed motors and mounted officers in those areas. And we continue to promote the uh, clean car campaign. Uh, as, as we note, as businesses start to reopen, events return to the city, uh, the number of vehicles in those areas uh, will increase in the likelihood of those crimes. We'll go to the next slide, please, for auto thefts. As has been previously reported by Chief Bryant and Chief Coit, we, we can still can continue to contend with a high number of cars that are stolen while they're running or with the keys in them. Uh, currently, 69% of all auto thefts this year in the city occurred while the vehicle was running or with the keys in them and the uh, driver stepped away. Uh, you'll notice a high concentration of those occurring uh, also in the zone five area. We have a number of resources that have been deployed. There are specialized details comprising of marked units, our air unit, uh, as well as a number of undercover resources have been saturating those areas and leading to a number of arrests. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing juvenile offenders uh, comprising a uh, number of the arrestees. Last week, a uh, individual's young 14-year-old was arrested as a result of that detail. We are working closely with the Georgia Tech Police Department, deploying uh, visual signs throughout the uh, Midtown area, uh, urging individuals not to leave the car running, not to leave the car without keys. Uh, this is also, uh, we've requested the food delivery services to do push notifications, uh, requesting that the deliveries not leave uh, their vehicles running as they run into a business to pick up food to deliver. That is a, a reoccurring uh, number of our victims are food delivery drivers. Uh, we've also have increased our illegal parking enforcement in that area as well. Uh, we have a number of social media announcements that we post asking the citizens not to leave the vehicles running. If you have the ability to repost those on any of your social media uh, platforms as council members, we would appreciate uh, that effort. I do want to touch on homicides. Uh, again, we, we are seeing our homicides occurring in areas where elevated uh, arguments are elevated. Individuals for the majority of our homicides have some sort of relationship. Uh, that is escalating or occurring to violence that leads to a homicide. Uh, at the last committee meeting, uh, a number of pieces of information or requests for the department, I want to go through a uh, majority of those now that were related around homicides. Uh, we will providing you at your next session a complete breakdown of what the relationships were for the 2020 homicides, as those can be uh, evolving of course of the investigation. Uh, we will be providing it then. The request was asked of how many of the offenders last year were repeat offenders uh, as far as uh, having criminal histories at the time they committed the homicide. Uh, 37 of our 90 suspects uh, identified last year were convicted felons. Uh, 17 had, of the 90 had no criminal history. Uh, and then 73 uh, had a mixture of misdemeanors or felony uh, arrest. Uh, the, the range of, of how many previous offenses of the identified suspect uh, ranged from uh, none uh, to one misdemeanor and then up to an individual who was arrested with 63 prior arrests. Those were 19 misdemeanors, 44 felonies of that individual, uh, which average out to uh, each of the individuals arrested uh, last year for or identified and charged for homicide, having uh, 11, an average of 11 priors uh, prior to the homicide being committed. Uh, we will also be providing you the updated APT facilities list that is currently being um, updated in, in conjunction with our partners at DEAN, and we'll have that for you. We anticipate by the, 8th, the March 8th meeting of this committee. And then the final uh, piece of information that was requested was the total number of recruits that are in training. Uh, right now, we have 84 recruits uh, in our training program. 64 are actively involved in three different recruit classes. Uh, one of those classes will swear in uh, on February, or did swear in on uh, February the 10th and entered field training. Uh, with the next group will be entering field training in March, and then the uh, class 270 will enter in uh, June. And then we have 20 recruits that are in a class zero status and will be assigned to a cabinet class in the very near future. Uh, Madam Chair, that's the uh, biweekly presentation of the police department. I'll be answered at, happy to answer any questions that you or the committee may have. Okay, please, uh, uh, if you have a question, and I see someone, I can't see the board, Ms. Lindo. Somebody is asking to speak, but my board is not showing. I, I can't. So if you can let me know. Can I ask a question real quick? Mr. Ferrocchi, okay. Okay, I'll ask you. Mr. Ferrocchi, I'll get you right after that. Uh, you talked about, Shiram, you talked about, obviously, we have 90 arrests 
or we talked about crime in terms of the, the people who were arrested. So 73 were misdemeanors and some others were par arrest. Give me that number again and what you were saying about that again. I, I kind of zoned in, in and out on that. Yes, so, Madam Chair. The request of information was for those arrested or suspects identified in homicides in 2020, uh, the previous offenses in criminal history of those individuals. Uh, 73 had uh, either a misdemeanor or a felony arrest. Uh, 37 uh, were convicted felons. And 17 of the 90 had no criminal history. Okay. And this is within what period of time was that? Was that the last year, you think, the last year? That is correct, ma'am. That was the uh, homicide suspects identified in 2020. And there's no way that you can, you said 73 were misdemeanors and other arrests. I'm just kind of interested in knowing what the mister, how many were misdemeanors, or are you saying that's a combination? We're, we're looking at studies in terms of how many folks with misdemeanors are continuously uh, creating, uh, coming back and doing other things. Is there any way you could break that down a little bit more specific in terms of misdemeanors? I mean, not now, but maybe come back. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. We can break that down and provide that. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Faroki, are you there? I am. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Deputy Chief Cherbaum, for your presentation, uh, its thoroughness and directness. Um, one comment and then one question. Uh, the comment is simply sometimes I, I think all of us can get caught up in uh, what's wrong and hearing from our residents and, and kind of um, calling for changes and kind of focus of APD or, or kind of specific issues we need you all to to turn your attention to, and that's true across other departments as well. But, you know, you step back from it the last 12 months, um, there's been a lot of demands and frustrations from residents, um, rightfully, rightfully so. But I, I step back from it sometimes and I say, you know, as we look at the numbers you're presenting and the response of APD, I, you know, democracy works. <laughs> you know, we hear from residents, we see stuff on the street, we advocate for it for citywide and, and district responses. And I, to APD's credit, y'all have, in every case, uh, redirected resources and, and ramped up focuses on or foci on on issues that have been vexing us. So I just want to say thank you and, and all of APD for all the work you guys have been doing. I know it's progress comes in fits and starts, but the, the system the system works with with respect to uh, responding to, to where people are in the city. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, the question I have is you know one of the persistent challenges that we've yet to solve, uh, at least in, in downtown Midtown, maybe in other districts as well, I'm not, I'm not aware, but it, I'm not saying it's only in downtown and Midtown, is um, you know, the ATV motorcycle kind of unruliness that tends to happen on the weekends. And I, my question is specific to one location where it tends to emanate from that it seems we haven't really been able to do anything about um, and I know it's resource intensive and that's the, the the BP across from the varsity on North Avenue is uh, as you know where a lot of the ATV and, and motorcycles will gather um, before heading through other parts of the city and I'm, I'm not suggesting that the mere the mere act of gathering is nothing that's illegal but everything that kind of comes after that oftentimes is riding on the sidewalk kind of ignoring traffic signals etc and I know this is a really tough issue to get our arms around, um, but it continues to be an issue that my residents are uh, raising with frustration and wanted to see if there's any update on approaches that APD and other jurisdictions uh, can collaborate on, on taking on, on this issue. Certainly, our, our approach in combating that particular activity is, is twofold. It's investigative. Uh, and then it is proactive as it can be. Once the vehicles begin moving on the city streets, um, we, we try to get into the space prior to that. So the gathering points, the fueling points, trailers moving, uh, ATVs and dirt bikes into the area. We do that in collaboration with our, our state partners, our county partners, and our air unit. Our goal is to disrupt those rides before they get into place uh, if they're being operated illegally, particularly the ATVs. Uh, the gathering points, uh, such as the BP, uh, our unit zone commanders will be deploying resources there. Um, what we would ask is that if anyone sees it occurring early to call 911 so we can get resources there. Uh, certainly, 
uh, as, as we receive intelligence and, and conversations such as this, make sure we convey it back to the zone commander so they can have resources there. Our second approach is securing arrest warrants for those engaging this activity. Uh, recently, we did uh, release uh, video footage from our body-worn cameras of individuals engaging in this activity. Um, we do want to thank members of the community that are providing tips, but if you do know who's uh, participating, organizing, uh, we'd like to see the same success in this area as we are with uh, street racers, and we will be obtaining arrest warrants and charging those that are, that are organizing and participating in these events as well. Thank you, Deputy Chief, and Madam Chair, that's all I have. Thank you. I don't see anybody else hanging. Are there any other questions? Ms. Council Member Hill, I have a question. I'm, uh, I'm not on online. Okay, Mr. Hill, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Shepard. Thank you, Deputy Chief Sherbaum, for the presentation. Um, and I'm not being on the computer, I wasn't able to see the presentation, but certainly listen to it. Um, questions I had. I know you mentioned that there were recruit numbers in the presentation. Just want to hear a little more in depth about the status of our current force, uh, absent recruits and reserves, um, and then what are the status of our current recruit classes? How many do we have? How many are in each class? Uh, when do they contemplate graduation? That's my first question. Yes, Councilman Bellis, as it relates to the recruits, they are in three different classes. Uh, there's class 268, 269, 270. Uh, we have 64 uh, recruits that are spread across the three classes, and I'll give you the specific breakdown, and we'll provide it uh, to you. Uh, their swear-in dates, we have one class that swore on February 10th, so they entered a six-week period of field training. Uh, then they will be assigned uh, to Field Operations Division. Uh, the second recruit class, 269, will be sworn in. Uh, in March, and then six weeks after that, they'll be assigned uh, to field operations, and then recruit class 270, which will be swearing in in June. Again, another six-week interval uh, to complete their field training, and they'll be assigned. And I'll make sure you receive the breakdown of, of the number of each of those classes. Thank you. And just a follow-up to that, kind of, you know, just want to understand the internal process of uh, when these recruit classes come out. Uh, how how are they filled in? Um, I imagine at least almost everyone is assigned to um, FOD and the zone when they come out of training, but how do we go in and backfill our zones? Do we look at crime numbers and call for service, or, or how does that happen? Yes, sir, there's uh, both of those. Uh, there's a number of, of assessments done, done by the Deputy Chief of Field Operations and Consultation Chief that will be looking at prevailing crime trends, calls for service, uh, the current staffing of uh, those particular zones. So as they are, are released from the academy, at that point, the decision will be made uh, to which the zone they'll be assigned to. Understood. And um, do you have any updated numbers on our, uh, mentioned in my first statement, um, on our current force minus recruits and reserves where we're at? We'll get that. Yeah, we'll get that for you, Councilman Hillis. You'll have that one, in that one as, as well. Okay. Um, I think that is all I have for now. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Thank you, Chairman Shepard. Thank you. Is there anyone else with questions for Deputy Chief Sherbaugh? Yeah. Yeah. And I had a question too. Okay, Mr. Bond, and then I think that's President Moore. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Thank you. All right. Thank Mr. you, Bond. Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Chief Sherbaum, for your presentation. I just have a couple of quick questions. One is the statistics seem to be holding on the, the car theft. I know that the clean uh, car campaign is, is ongoing. Has there been any thought given to expanding the clean, clean car campaign or you know, increase the marketing or awareness of it because it doesn't seem like people are getting the message, particularly if they're doing the obvious, what they should not be doing, leaving their car running and then expecting it to be there when they come back. Yes, Councilor Bond, we are exploring how to get the message out. Our, our social media platforms on Twitter, 
uh, Instagram and Facebook have very solid prevention tips that if, if, if followed, we would see a reduction of both of these crime categories. Right now, we're working with the Midtown Improvement District as well as the Downtown Improvement District uh, to, to replicate uh, our crime prevention messages. Uh, we're also asking apartment complexes, uh, venue sites where we know individuals come to, and we also have high elevated occurrences of these thefts to replicate that uh, as well. Uh, so as we work with our public affairs unit, we are identifying where do we have the opportunity to expand that message delivery that we can have, have the breakdown on. Okay, thank you. And then related to that, I know that a lot of the gun thefts from 2020 were related, I guess, from guns being left in cars. Has there, have you seen that trend continuing? I know it's only been a month and a half, but have you seen that trend continuing in this year so far? Yeah, unfortunately, sir, it is continuing as, as well. Guns being left in vehicles unsecured are being are be taken this year. Okay. And then I just want to shift. Uh, I know that you were expounding on the follow-up uh, for the domestic violence. Uh, I know last year that trend was about 48% increase over the previous year. Is there any efforts to highlight the resources that you mentioned, uh, kind of like in the form of the, you know, clean our campaign, so that persons who are suffering know that they can avail themselves of what APD is doing? Yes, sir. We're currently partnering with the Prose Prosecutor's Council of Georgia uh, to bring in uh, additional ways to, con to convey that to the community, to our officers to be able to deliver it to victims of domestic violence. Uh, we're also actively tracking weekly victims of domestic violence to ensure we, uh, that we do not have repeat locations or, or victims. Um, that may need some elevated assistance in that area. And, and also the uh, rolling out of additional roll call training for officers, highlighting what other resources are available, not only with Victims Assistance Program, but other community-based partners. And this, this, do you know off the top of your head of these individuals charged with domestic violence, uh, they're, are they typically being charged with the state offenses or are there any municipal offenses? Because I know that if they go to the, the city facility, they're apt to get uh, signed out on a signature bond. And of course, if you've been in a city dispute in a domestic situation, you don't want that person readily returning to that circumstance, you know, without having been to court first. But do you have any idea of? If, if these are state charges that are being uh, levied or I mean, what's the situation with that? Yes, sir. Each, each arrest for a family violence offense will be the corresponding state charge, be it a misdemeanor or a felony, depending on the elements of the crime. Okay, thank you. Well, that'll be, that, no, that's all my questions for now, Deputy Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Ms. Moore. Uh, yes, just a couple of questions uh, related to bars and nightclubs and restaurants. Are we increasing any patrols around those, particularly those that we know have been troubled locations? Yes, ma'am. The, the increased focus of the police department is, is in three areas. Uh, our license permits and investigative approach, uh, compliance checks, uh, the deployment of zone level and specialized unit resources from the department, um, and then also the increased uh, inspections of any extra job officers that may be at those locations. Okay, and then I guess a related question. Ms. Moore, yes. I, just asked, I just talked to Deputy Chief Court because they have been doing a lot of appointments lately, but I asked him very specifically at the next meeting to bring forth the data in terms of where they've been focusing, what have they done. So I'm asking for a much more comprehensive report on that at our next meeting. Thank you. Okay. Is a part of that report going to be actions that are taken or licenses that are in question? I can ask them to see if they're including that, how put their process in terms of their process. I will ask that. Yeah, I, asked. yeah I would just like to specifically know which ones have been uh, action taken against that we have actively through license and permits uh, either shut down or start the process of 
um, shutting them down or taking their license and then those that are under that because I get asked that all the time about specific clubs and I don't have any information to share. So if you can just make that a part of your report, I'll look forward to it in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? Was that it for you, Ms. Moore? Yes, I'm I'm done. Okay. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chief Sheerbaum. Uh, I also thought that your last uh, PowerPoint was on the vaccination for tracking our vaccination for our APD. Uh, and it's great to know that we are in the process of doing that. So you all have, haven't seen it. You all seem to have a, a, a good process of set, a set up in terms of getting doses of vaccinations and number of people starting from the 16th. And I think thus far you're saying you have a total of 107 who are registered. You got them broke down by group. So thank you for that. I'm glad to know that we really want to support you all in, in making sure you are the frontline workers and we want to make sure that you all really get everything you need. So thanks for that report also. You're welcome, ma'am. All right. All right. Um, thank you so much. Question. Mr. Bond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Deputy Chief, there was a suit this weekend uh, out in the, uh, I guess it was the, in, in West Atlanta, the High Tower Road uh, area. Uh, get a video shoot. And my question is, I know that uh, for certain movies and, and video production, uh, is it still required that there's an APD officer there in the instance when uh, traffic or, you know, streets, access to streets might be involved? Yes, sir. With the closure of a street related to any shooting or going back, there will be a law enforcement officer. Uh, based on the type of closure being uh, asked and being required uh, generally to be present and overseeing that closure. And so in, in this, I guess because they were on private property, it wasn't required that APD officer for the video shoot. That, uh, that is correct, sir. From my understanding of the current uh, ordinance, that would not be required for this on private property. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sherbon. We appreciate you coming before us today. Thank you. You're welcome, ma'am. All right. We'll move to item number two from the presentation. Our new fire chief, Chief Rod Smith. Welcome and please come forward. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Council Members, Council President Moore. Uh, it is my pleasure to come before you as the new Fire Chief for the City of Atlanta. And we will be presenting today a quarterly presentation for Atlanta Fire Rescue on behalf of the men and women of Atlanta Fire Rescue Department. We're going to follow you with your presentation. Is that what we're doing, Chief Smith? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You'll be following me along with the presentation, if you don't mind. Thank you. Okay. As I stated earlier, we will be uh, conducting our quarterly review today on behalf of the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department's men and women. And there again, I am Rod Smith, the fire chief appointed by our Honorable Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. Next slide, please. Atlanta Fire Rescue, we always begin with our mission and our vision. Uh, our vision is for Atlanta Fire Rescue strives for excellence and emergency preparedness and response to enhance our customer focused innovative role as industry leaders while overcoming expanding risks. And our mission, the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department provides prompt quality service to our stakeholders that promotes safety, well-being, and enhances sustainability and enriches the quality of life through professional development and dedication to service. Next slide, please.
our goals and objectives um, in line with the Atlanta City Council is we will work with the mayoral administration to ensure fire engines are fully staffed, AFRD fire station renovations and replacements are ongoing. We will provide a plan for a lateral hiring and recruitment program initiative, as well as develop a plan for new AFRD training facilities up and coming. The Atlanta Fire Rescue Department will provide a safe working environment for all AFRD members and complete enhancements, repairs, and replacements of all AFRD facilities and its fleet. Next slide, please. Our organizational priorities are and will continue to be service excellence as it relates to all calls for service, staffing and staffing strategies to improve staffing and address attrition and to address our fleet facility enhancements and construction, which covers our renovations, construction, additions and replacements. I'll now turn it over to our first deputy, Byron Kennedy, to go into our service excellence numbers on behalf of the department, but I'll make myself available throughout the presentation as questions arise to assist with giving you the answers that you may desire. First, Deputy Kimmy. Uh, thank you, Chief Smith. Okay, if you could go to slide number six for me. It references our calls for service. Greetings, Madam Chair, Madam President, and other, other distinguished council members. On slide number six, we are seeing our calls for service within Atlanta Fire Rescue Department. Our calls for service are maintaining as they have over the past few quarters. Uh, however, you can see the, the emergency medical services still remains to be our number one uh, frequency uh, for calls for service. Uh, looking at aviation at the top of this particular screen, uh, aviation actually is, uh, uh, it looks like, what is that, about 65%. 65% uh, of all the calls that happen within aviation are referencing emergency medical services. Uh, in the downtown area, uh, roughly 80% are related to emergency medical services. All right, slide number eight, please. Slot number eight references our second quarter staffing. As you can see indicated at the top right, our second quarter staffing was 876 sworn firefighters. Uh, that is inclusive of 36 firefighter recruits that are currently in training. And uh, the civilian numbers, of course, are, are very, very similar to what they've been as well as far as the, the vacancies as well. So uh, our biggest piece is uh, the second quarter, we had uh, 697 in the uh, general fund that were sworn and 179 in aviation uh, that are sworn. All right, slide number nine. Slide number nine talks about our attrition. Uh, the attrition is it's basically the same as it's been as well. One of the big things that uh, I will mention, as we've mentioned in the past, is that during the month of November and December, we typically see a higher number of retirement. And uh, during this particular uh, second quarter, we had nine resignations, and I believe there were a total of 22 in FY20 totally. So uh, these numbers are, are decently still uh, higher than where we want them, but we do expect them, of course, at the end of the year. Uh, there were a total of 21 persons exiting the organization uh, who were sworn firefighters, as well as three civilians who exited the organization as well uh, within FY21 uh, second quarter. All right, if you could go over to slide number 11, please. Slot number 11 uh, mentions the 
facilities priority. Uh, this actually, as I view it, uh, this actually was not the completed version, but uh, I'll, I'll fill in a couple of pieces. Uh, the first piece is uh, Station 32. Station 32, as we all know, is at the airport. Uh, it's one of the busiest, if not the busiest, station at the airport. Uh, it's currently under the, the design phase, and construction is scheduled to begin uh, March of this year. The next item here is uh, replacing the burn building. We've talked about this before in the past. Uh, that is going through the procurement process right now. Uh, this replacement burn building is a temporary structure for our firefighters to uh, go through the uh, the burn building or the uh, we actually call them connex boxes. The next item, all right, we're, we're still on slide number slide number eleven, which uh, mentions facilities pri priorities. The training and development facility, uh, we are really excited about this. Uh, we're still in the process of securing a location. We have an we have a real good idea where it's going to be and all that, but uh, that's what we are looking uh, to do is to have a solid training facility where we can train our firefighters. Uh, we are making do now with uh, with usage of other facilities, but to have a dedicated training facility will be huge for us as well. Uh, the only other piece that I will add on this particular slide that is that was not put on here when it was composed uh, is Station 22, uh, Fire Station 22. I, I know Council Member Hillis, I, I saw you with the um, with the fire station being built in the background. So uh, of course, Station 22. We're really excited about the fact that 22 is in the process of uh, going through construction now. So uh, that's where we are with the facility priority. And the last slide, slide number 12, uh, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Chief Smith to close us out and for questions. Thank you, Chief Kennedy. Uh, this is Chief Smith again uh, here if there are any questions on behalf of Atlanta Fire Rescue. Okay. Do I have any questions? I'm sorry, I'm kind of like, I, I, let me just start with one. Fire station number 32, is a, I believe that's in my district on Cleveland Avenue. I see it's up for renovations. We went back and forth for a minute whether it's going to be renovated or rebuilt. So we are trying to do not, what now? Yes, Madam Chair. So station 30 on Cleveland Avenue, we have it down okay. as renovations. Okay. We have it down okay. for renovations because there are some things that have to be done just so that it can remain tenable. However, Station 32 is on the list uh, for replacement. It is number four, right behind Station 31. Okay, thank you. Anyone else for questions? Councilman Hillis. Yes, yeah, okay, Mr. Hillis, and then I'll follow with Ms. Smith. Ms. Moore. I'm sorry, I, was that Ms. Smith or Ms. Moore? Mr. Hill, let's go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Chief Smith uh, and others for this report. Uh, first question is, um, I guess this was about a, a year or so ago, you know, there was a big debacle about the EMS at the airport. You know, it goes from the sick, from, you know, one's on the bike, and there was a fatal heart attack. Um, and there was a lot of talk back then and a pledge to expand EMS coverage at the airport. Uh, especially these quick response teams on, on the bike. Um, so is there now around the clock coverage at the airport with these type team, EMS teams? Um, can you give me some, some specifics on that, please? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Hillis. Uh, as it relates to the MMRT teams or the bike teams at the airport, we currently have two members that are hired. Uh, we currently have four that are in the process of going through the background check uh, as we speak now. Um, but we, in spite of not having the total of 15 that we desire, uh, knowing also too that the coverage or the intent was not for the bikes to be out for 24 hours. However, they would be out during peak hours 
uh, which would equivalent would be equivalent to two eight hour shifts. Uh, we are currently augmenting that with our station staffing, having them to stage up uh, in the concourses during those periods when we do not have the bike teams available. Okay, so sounds like we have a lot of work to do, but for those two eight hour shifts, do those overlap or that would, would that provide a full like 16 hours out of 24 hours of coverage? So it would be a, a 16 hours of coverage. Okay. All right, and um, kind of was brought up this one to I'm very, uh, very happy with uh, 22 progressing. I know that took a lot of work on uh, everyone, everyone's part with the fire, uh, fire department, including uh, former Chief Slaughter and, and others, and uh, myself and Councilmember Westmoreland. I'm um, going after the needed funding that, that had arisen, given this was put off for a few years. Uh, but glad to see that they're moving, that they're moving dirt, and I'm looking forward to having a groundbreaking and a, a ribbon cutting there very soon uh, with everyone. So thank you all. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your support in this project as well. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, was that Miss Miss Moore goes this more? I'm not sure if we, I thought I heard Miss Smith, but I may have misunderstood. Miss Moore. It was me, yes. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a couple of questions on equipment and personnel because I saw some news stories. No, within the last few weeks uh, about the equipment that's down in terms of trucks um, and the number of personnel on a truck. So can you speak to that? Is, has that been rectified? Are we still experiencing those issues? Uh, yes, ma'am, um, Madam President. Uh, we have rectified the fleet issue uh, there were some challenges that we had with getting the reserve equipment back up and operational. So we've been working uh, directly with fleet services to make sure that we take care of that. Uh, as it relates to staffing, uh, we still have the ongoing staffing challenges. Uh, we are aggressively in the space of trying to change our hiring model and get additional people in. But also uh, another point to note is that uh, we are basically experiencing the same uh, situations that are, that are going on in life as a whole, meaning the COVID uh, environment. And so it is impacting our staffing and it is uh, impacting how we staff the stations. So we continue to hire and hire overtime to cover those vacancies that we may have. Okay, thank you. Cheryl, Michelle, Councilmember Hillis, I have one more question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, Chief Smith, I was going to gonna let it go, but uh, since uh, President Moore brought up staffing, I'll just go ahead and put you on the spot. Um, I know you've been listening in as we uh, talked to uh, Chief Slaughter, and you mentioned you know, changing our staffing models or, or hiring models um, to getting more of those vacancies filled in AFRD. So what is your philosophy um, in getting a, a uh, sustainable lateral program uh, into AFRD so we can pull from uh, other, others, other stations that, that, that have folks that want to become, you know, a big city firefighter here in the city of Atlanta? Thank you, Councilmember Hillis. Uh, the, the lateral program for the fire department has always been an issue that has been on the table. However, we are still evaluating uh, the validity of it. There are just so many challenges right now as it relates to hiring and filling staff. And so I won't say that a lateral problem, or excuse me, a lateral program is going to be the solution for Atlanta Fire Rescue. But I do know that uh, as of this moment, we currently have to aggressively get into a space where we change our hiring model and we get more people in the door to train them, period. And so uh, we will continue to evaluate that along with uh, the new hire concept. Thank you, and definitely agree, uh, given where we're at, it's definitely not going to be a uh, full solution, but I, I think it could be at least part of the solution. And, and then, as you mentioned, we, we've got to get aggressive given where our numbers are. So thank you for that, and uh, we'll definitely follow up uh, in future uh, committee meetings about that. Thank you, Chief. 
Um, thank you, sir. Madam Chair, oh. this is Customer Faroki. I have a question if I can get in the queue. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to stay on the same topic, Chief, um, that Council, Member, Council President Moore and Council Member Hillis have touched on, which is the staffing issue. You know, I, I appreciate it being a priority. I'd like to push you a little bit further um, and see if you're willing to articulate a couple things. One is, you know, what is what is an effective um, hiring framework look like to add numbers at a rate faster than attrition and retirement? So, you know, we talk about a lateral program. That's a piece of the puzzle. Um, what other tools do you have other than the academy and lateral hiring to increase the numbers? And if those are the only two tools we have, how do, how do you foresee us using them more effectively to um, to increase our numbers? That's one. And then number two is if you had to state a number over the next, say, 12 to 24 months, how many new firefighters, whether laterals or new recruits, do we need? Thank you, Councilman Faroki. Uh, and that's an excellent question. What I say is this, that my position is this, is that we have to explore all options as it relates to getting staffing. However, we want to make sure that we get quality employees and sustainable employees. Uh, what we see is that the model is changing as it relates to hiring and that the 30-year employee is something of the past. So we've got to make sure that who we get in uh, are definitely going to be qualified and eligible to do the job. Um, as it relates to the types of programs that we have, obviously the bridge program is a consideration. Uh, we have to get the new recruits in, but we also have to get more aggressive in bringing in uh, members of the APS or Atlanta Public School System as they graduate. Uh, we seem to get an awful lot of applications, uh, but we have problems getting them through the background. So we're going to have to start looking outside of where we recruit, changing the footprint, uh, have a meeting scheduled with our recruitment team uh, later part this week to talk about uh, an outward-bound program and going out to get the employees or the type of employees we need to do the job. And this is going to be uh, a diversity uh, exercise to make sure that we are incumbent of uh, the makeup of the city of Atlanta. Thank you. And to push you on the last question, you know, is there a number that you have on the board that, in, you know, it, it, presuming current rates of attrition and retirement, how many folks do we need to hire across various levels over the next year to two years? So the attrition space that we're in right now, and thank you for that question as well, the attrition space that we are in right now is something that has been mounting for a number of years, and so we are now in a space where we are forced to deal with it. Uh, given that we are on the cusp of getting uh, an additional space uh, to utilize for training, uh, I would aggressively say my number that I would put out is to look to hire 200 people per year over the next uh, three years. Great. Thank you so much for that. And that's all I have, Madam Chair. Okay. Anyone else? Well, thank you, Chief Rock. Mr. Smith. I welcome you. I haven't had a one-on-one -on -one with you yet. I plan on reaching out to you for us to just get together and talk. Uh, but I'm looking forward to working with you. I've heard there's some good things about you, so looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes, ma'am, Madam Chair, and I appreciate it, and I look forward to speaking with you as well. All right. Thank you. We'll now move on to our last presentation, which is Department of Law, our city attorney, Ms. Nina Hickson. Ms. Hickson, are you there? I am. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, committee members, Council President Moore. I'm pleased to provide the quarterly report covering October through December of 2020, as well as some current uh, highlights of activities going on in the law department. And I'd like to, again, um, acknowledge my very hardworking team and uh, say that despite having to work under remote conditions for almost a year, that they continue to produce on behalf of the city of Atlanta. 
If we can move to slide two, please. So during this report, I will provide an overview of our COVID-19 pandemic response, our law staff accomplishments, highlights and major matters across the division, division accomplishments, the total claims and settlement payments, uh, with an update of the quarterly numbers, as well as our outside counsel report. So if we could move to slide number four, where we begin to talk about our COVID pandemic response. Oh, uh, the law department has provided the following support in response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, we have successfully drafted, negotiated, and finalized an IGA with Invest Atlanta for the administration and management of a supplemental grant awarded by the U.S. Department of Commerce Economic Development Authority in support of the Atlanta CARES Revolving Loan Program. Additionally, we drafted and reviewed over 45 contract amendments, task orders, and change orders across various matters, including agreements for coronavirus relief funds and fund-supported programs at, on an as-needed basis. Slide five. We've also negotiated and finalized the key agreement on behalf of the Department of Parks and Rec, securing services to prepare, transport, and serve meals to children participating in the after school hot meals program, um, where we trans, where, uh, at 19 different recreation centers within the city as authorized by section 13 of the national school act and operated under u.s department of agricultural regulations next slide we'll be talk about some of the accomplishments of some members of the law staff moving to slide seven would like to highlight the work of jesse dagan tillman who provides advice and counsel to our procurement department uh, she also has been involved with the International Human Trafficking Institute for the last seven years and has, and, uh, in January hosted a symposium titled Combating Human Trafficking, um, with the goal of stopping the demand of labor and sex trafficking in the Metro Atlanta area. Jesse also became a member of the IMLA, which is International Municipal Law Association. International Steering Committee, uh, which serves as a think tank bringing together municipal attorneys across Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, and North America to discuss and address the commonalities of representing local government, as well as gaining insight into the laws and their differences. We can go to slide number eight, please. Um, our team member, Karima Lewis, who is the chair of the Georgia Association of Women Lawyers Public Affairs Committee, moderated a panel entitled A Call to Action, Women Lawyers, Social and Political Engagement in Georgia. And a recent addition to our team, um, an attorney by the name of Kelly Hooper, who has recently joined our litigation team, has been named a super lawyer. She has uh, had this achievement each year since 2000. It's a rating service of outstanding lawyers from more than 70 practice areas who have attained a high degree of peer recognition and professional achievement. The selection process includes independent research, peer nominations, and peer evaluations. Only 5% of lawyers in Georgia receive this distinction. So we're very proud of Kelly and glad to have her as a new team member. Moving on to the litigation division, if we can move to slide number 10, we'll highlight a few of the cases that were resolved during the um, last quarter. The first one is the case of Sorrow versus City of Atlanta. This is a 1983 claim brought by a plaintiff who alleged that the city had harassed her through unwarranted enforcement of the code, um, including in her mind and unlawful administrative search of her house. The city was successful in arguing against and, and uh, getting the court to grant a motion for judgment of the pleadings in the city's favor in that particular case. 
Moving to slide 11, this is the matter of Barner versus City of Atlanta. This particular plaintiff sued the department as a result of injury sustained after an encounter with an individual police officer um, in, a, in a police vehicle. The city was successful in arguing um, for immunity of the defendant police officer and um, and as well as uh, arguing for sovereign immunity in this case. And so the matter was dismissed on December 29th. 2020. Slide number 12. This is the Samuels case. This is involving a claim that the city had incorrectly and falsely read uh, water meters, which caused the water bill to increase by a very large amount. The plaintiff alleged that he was entitled to $5,000 in damages and $500 in interest. Uh, the city filed a motion to dismiss First, asserting the plaintiff sued an entity which is not capable of being sued. In other words, they sued the Department of Watershed, which is not a separate entity from the city, uh, and that the, the plaintiff also failed to provide the answer item notice to the city prior to the suit. The motion was heard on December 3rd. The plaintiff failed to appear, and the dismissal was entered on that particular day. Slide number 13, this is case of Williams and Sandage versus City of Atlanta. The plaintiff filed this case one day before the statute of limitations ran. However, the plaintiff never perfected service on the city. The allegations in the complaint indicated that the plaintiff uh, alleges $34,000 in injuries after being rear-ended by an ATB officer. In November, after hearing before the judge, the judge gave the plaintiff 20 days to perfect service on the city. The plaintiff failed to do so, and this particular matter has been uh, dismissed as a result. Slide number 14. This uh, particular matter involves Club Days of Vu, where the club, I'm sorry, where the city filed for a complaint for injunctive relief as well as a temporary restraining order against the club to prohibit it from operating in violation of various city ordinances, including the city alcohol code, building code, also operating without proper permits and operating as a nuisance. Um, this particular case is relevant to the question that the council president asked about efforts being made as it relates to um, certain clubs. And so this uh, particular matter is one that's being handled by the Nuisance Working Group, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. Um, but you have uh, several divisions in the city who are working together, including the city attorney's office and the solicitor's office. And so um, we were successful in gaining the uh, injunctive relief through the work of Erica Smith, who, as you know, is a deputy solicitor but for purposes of this matter was appointed a special city attorney and able to bring this case in uh, Fulton uh, uh, Superior Court. And so the, um, the injunctive relief was granted and um, we are supposed to go back to court, I believe sometime in April on this matter, but um, the order restrains them from doing, operating in any matter for 90 days. The next slide, which is slide number 15, is also related to the Deja Vu Sports Bar and Lounge. And this was based on a decision to approve the fine and suspension of the plaintiff's alcohol license following the recommendation of the License Review Board. The city argued the case should be dismissed based on the plaintiff's failure to comply with multiple aspects of the appropriate procedures. The motion to dismiss was heard on January the 28th, and the court granted the motion to dismiss on February 2nd, thus upholding the decision approving the fine and suspension of the alcohol license. We can move to slide number 17, where we begin to talk about the work of the business services division starting with the contract division um, the following contract legal support was provided by the um, business services division 
the um, contract division drafted, negotiated, and finalized the key technology services agreement for the city's ethics office, uh, which was procuring an electronic ethics filing system to be used for annual filing of financial disclosures and also to allow public access and use of the city of the system to conduct searches of city disclosure forms. Additionally, the contract division developed a new legal services agreement template for the Department of Law that will streamline the procurement of legal services. Next slide, slide number 18. Contracts division also developed and released four new subrecipient agreement templates as well as an amendment template for the Department of Grants and Community Development to transfer the regulatory compliance obligations more efficiently as they relate to HUD entitlement grants as well as making sure that these agreements are in compliance with the City of Atlanta code requirements. This division also drafted, negotiated, and finalized a critical cooperative agreement with Deloitte Consulting to enable the completion of the city ACL cloud implementation. And also of significance and importance is the timely negotiation and finalization of an agreement with BridgePay uh, to provide crucial gateway payment processing services on behalf of the city's Department of Finance. Slide number 19, contract division also assisted with the development of agreements to facilitate the review of policing practices as well as the uh, community engagement related to that, uh, which involves key partners such as the Atlanta Committee for Progress, APDU Urban Planning Management, and the Police Executive Research Forum, also known as PERF. Uh, additionally, the contract division drafted and finalized fiscal year 20 aid Atlanta housing program HOPWA grants agreement, ensuring access to safe, affordable housing to low income individuals and families living with HIV AIDS. Slide 20, um, as relates to the procurement, uh, Department of Procurement, the law department successfully managed three bid protests in support of the Department of Procurement, as well as provided training to the two procurement department senior leadership on the handling of bid protests. Um, we also conducted legislative reviews on 67 various procurement related matters. We reviewed 21 solicitations on behalf of the Department of Procurement before they re were released and put on the street. And we prepared and delivered training to 32 managers, contract specialists, and other staff in the procurement department regarding the required submittals and solicitations and standard contract templates. Slide 21, we um, also um, prepared corrective legislation in support of the Department of Finance's APL cloud implementation and implemented a new legal services request intake form uh, with the Department of Procurement, AIM, Dean, and Department of Grants and Community Development. Slide 22. In terms of the finance um, portion of the business services division, uh, the following legal support was provided to internal and external clients. Uh, annual disclosure report that were needed to be filed for past initial full bond issuances on the electronic municipal market access or EMA system were completed. We provided advice on the IRFA, which is Urban Residential Finance Authority Housing Opportunity Bonds, which legislation was adopted on January 4th, 2021. And we provided assistance on the establishment on, of the Atlanta Beltline Special Services district and proposed ad valorem tax levy. We hosted an interdepartmental training on public finance, the nuts and bolts of public finance. And we also provided the following training to internal and external clients. The one being the collaborative disclosure procedure training workshop, which we, we held along with the Department of Finance and Invest Atlanta. That workshop was led by our disclosure council 
from Greenberg Trowick, that's uh, John Wilson and Melissa Rogers. And then we did a training on commercial paper, the commercial paper process, which was led by Doug Selby of the um, Hunt and Andrews firm. Moving to slide number 23, in terms of uh, the real estate uh, part of business services, they provided the following support to city planning, aviation, Dean, Parks and Rec, ATL, DOT, Public Works, and Department of Watershed Management. That included drafting or providing comments on over 20 pieces of legislation, drafting over 10 leases, licenses, or other agreements, preparing over 23 encroachments and or easements, coordinating closing on four property acquisitions, and reviewing and facilitating the closing of approximately 15 parcels, easements, and temporary easements for the City of Atlanta transportation project. Moving to slide 24, the uh, land use team of the Business Services Division worked with the Department of City Planning on preparing updates to the impact fee ordinance, updates to the associated fee study, as well as providing staffing to the CDHS Committee's impact fee ordinance work session. And as most of you know, this update will be the first one that has taken place since 1993. Moving to slide 25, um, most of you read about the um, petition for injunctive relief that we filed with the Surface Transportation Board. We filed that on February the 12th on the 15th, Norfolk Southern indicated that, that it was going to terminate the particular project. And so we expect to get an order from the SCB um, based on Norfolk Southern's motion to dismiss in light of the fact that they are not proceeding with the Catahoochee Brick Site um, uh, program that uh, they were proposing to do. What is left to be done is uh, we're working out and trying to get an understanding of what is going to be required in terms of making sure that that site is properly um, secured and that to the extent there are some environmental issues that those issues are addressed. We can move to uh, slide 27. I think you recently received a memorandum uh, from me regarding the upcoming redistricting, which is usually um, done as a result of the census. Uh, you've gotten the announcements and probably have heard through the press that the information from the Census Bureau is going to be extremely late this year. We will not get that data until September 30th, 2021. Because of the lateness of this, the city will not be able to meet its uh, obligations under the code to undertake the redistricting effort prior to the November general election. And so that's going to require probably um, some legislation or at least a, a charter change since we're not going to be able to comply in time um, with the redistricting. Next. Uh, slide 28. Let's see. We also provided legislative support to various uh, city departments. Uh, one of significance is the Department of City Planning Office of Housing and Community Development legislation to update the city's urban redevelopment plan for the first time in 10 years. Um, the update should incorporate the past 10 years' worth of new local neighborhood plans into the urban redevelopment plan. And by updating the plan, Invest Atlanta will have more opportunities to invest in and support neighborhoods that were not addressed in the previous plan. Uh, our department also drafted legislation for the call and the conducting of the 2021 City of Atlanta municipal elections as well as providing assistance in the preparation of the state legislative package. Slide 28. Uh, I'm sorry, slide 29. The uh, 
Public Safety and Special Initiatives Team of the Business Services Division assisted with the formation of the Mayor's Nuisance Property Working Group. That group consists of members from various city departments, including the Executive Offices, Law, the Solicitor's Office, APD, AFRD, Code Enforcement, Office of Buildings and Licenses, and Submit. This group is meeting um, on a weekly basis, and within the last six weeks, um, legislation has been adopted to create this group. The group has met weekly to strategize as it relates to dealing with nuisance properties, and two city solicitors were deputized by the city attorney to pursue injunctive relief against property owners. Uh, slide 30, the Department of Law also drafted legislation to, or assisted with the drafting of legislation to amend the city's code of ordinance to require CPA certified documentation evidencing that an establishment qualifies as a restaurant. And it also added the revocation of alcohol license as a penalty for the first due cause violation. Moving to slide number 32, we'll talk about the work of the operations division. Uh, the labor and employment group of operations worked uh, since September of 2020 to resolve a complaint that was filed with the U.S. Department of Labor regarding the city's handling of family medical leave requests. Um, we entered into a proposed settlement with the Department of Labor where they required us to conduct a 60 to 90 day audit of our practices regarding family medical leave. And uh, so the Department of Law worked very closely with human resources and um, did the audit as well as presented its findings to the Department of Labor which indicated that it was pleased with the results. And on January the 12th, the Department of Labor uh, closed the uh, particular matter. Moving to slide number 33, in watershed, the watershed legal support included amendments to the city's post-development stormwater management codes. Um, they were passed and began in, in full operation December 1st, 2020. And these were amendments that were required under the city's state-issued regulatory permit, as well as the requirements of the North Metro Water District. The intent of the amendments are to better control post-development stormwater runoff. Additionally, the, um, the, the city attorney's office is working with the Department of Watershed to begin the process of drafting and uh, negotiating new wholesale water IGAs with the city of Hapeville and the Clayton County Water Authority. These agreements were last negotiated over 20 years ago. Slide number 34, the um, watershed department, the watershed division of the legal department work uh, very diligently with the water and sewer appeals board to get them started again in terms of having hearings online. As a result, there were amendments to operational rules that had to be developed, as well as training for the board, as well as uh, training to make sure that the board was in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Additionally, the Riparian Buffer Technical Panel recommenced hearings online on October 10th, 2020, uh, with the assistance of the Department of Law. Again, we worked to help that particular panel to draft procedural rules, conducted training on Robert's rules, as well as making them aware of their obligations under the Open Meetings Act. Slide 35, uh, in terms of revenue recovery, the Department of Law was successful in recovering $150,000 for water and sewer accounts on behalf of the Department of Watershed. These recoveries were for large multi-residential buildings that had significant balances. So we were able to bring those up to date and the accounts are now in compliance and the customers are paying their current charges. Slide 36, the transportation and taxation portion of the operations division helped to recover 122,000 in revenue from two 
customers, um, both related to operational uh, or business license uh, recovery. One involved a one year of negotiation, which resulted in the collection of 102000 and the second ended up uh, over two years of negotiation in the amount of $20,000. In December of this year, we timely uh, filed our save and e-verify reports, which are required by the Georgia Department of Audit and Account. And uh, we were able to certify that the city uh, is has been uh, complying and listing private employers, applying for business licenses and all the documents required to operate the business, listing all contractors entering into any contract or purchase order with the city for the physical performance of services totaling more than $2,500, confirming that all public benefits have been properly administered by the city of Atlanta and certifying compliance with the state sanctuary policy. Slide 37, in terms of aviation, we have continued to monitor the bankruptcies which have been filed by Hertz and Advantage Car Rentals. There have been two additional bankruptcies which we are uh, handling or monitoring on behalf of the airport, one being with L'Occitane en Provence, which is an airport concessionaire, the other being airport van rental, which is an off-airport car rental company. At this time, we are preparing the proofs of claim to be filed in each of those bankruptcies. Additionally, and you probably are familiar with this, back in December of 2017, when there was a major power outage um, at the airport resulting in um, um, the airport being uh, severely um, disabled uh, during that time, we were finally able to conclude negotiations with the city, Georgia Power, and AATC regarding certain claims that arose out of that incident, as well as working uh, out the installation of backup generators and other necessary life saving safety redundancies at the airport. Uh, this was a long time in the making, but I am happy to say that we have successfully concluded with those negotiations and the execution of those documents. Moving to slide 38, the Department of Law offered training to the Department of Aviation regarding the city's legislative process. We were able to um, train 65 Department of Aviation staff members during that time. Moving to the next session where we talk about pending new and resolved claims. Moving to slide number 40. In uh, the second quarter, there was a 9% decrease in pending claims when, when one compares the numbers from quarter two of last year. So in de December 31st, 2020, there were 461 claims as opposed to the 507 that there were in quarter two of December 2019. Uh, during quarter two, the law department received 365 new claims, and in quarter two, the claims team resolved, resolved 194 claims. Going to 41, this is an explanation of itemized claims and settlement payments by department um, for the quarter two we had a uh, demand uh, in terms of litigation of uh, claims amounting to forty one thousand eight hundred fifty eight dollars we were able to resolve those a little less at thirty six thousand five hundred thirty nine dollars and these involved claims of public works and watershed management in terms of claim settlement, we had a total demand of claims in the amount of $18,664,892. We were able to resolve those claims in the amount of $239,533. Most of them came from the general fund with um, one coming from Watershed. Moving to um, slide number 40, 43, I'm sorry. The um, 
it, when you combine the first two quarters of this year, we successfully litigated case settlement, resulting in the city only paying $280,897 when the demand amount was a million thirty-three twenty-six. We've also successfully negotiated claim settlement, resulting in the city paying only $362,620 when the demand amount was $19,547,622. And um, the Department of Law has successfully litigated and negotiated claims and settlements as I previously outlined. Um, slide number 44. This talks about our outside counsel spending for fiscal year 21. We experienced an increase uh, over last year this time between the months of July and February of 2020 and July to February of 2021. There was a 10% increase in outside spending as it relates to aviation, largely due to the um, bankruptcy work that we're having to handle as well as spending related to the um, SEC investigation, which has been ongoing for a while. And we also have the um, payment for the disparity study, which continues at this time, as well as the aviation department's portion of the independent review of the Office of Contract Compliance. There was a 22% decrease, however, in terms of outside council spending for the watershed fund. But as it relates to the general fund, we had a 38% increase. Again, I would point to the one-time expense occurrences, including the Kemp lawsuit, the um, general fund portion of the disparity study, as well as the general fund portion of the independent review of the Office of Contract Compliance. Thus ends my report. And I'm available for questions. Questions from my colleagues. No questions. Well, I would tell you that was a very thorough and long report, but it was very comprehensive. Uh, it's fixing. So I appreciate your presentation today. You truly show what you all have been doing. And we appreciate, I appreciate your department. I'm sure my colleagues do also. So thank you so much. Madam Chair, I, I have a question. Yes. yes. I have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. I guess my question is, uh, thank you for your very thorough report and all the good work that your department continues to do, Madam City Attorney. Uh, but I do have a question about an order that we received on Friday evening. Uh, I believed it to be an executive order. I was since told by someone else that it was an administrative order. What is, if any, the difference between an executive order and an administrative order? In general, an executive order is one that would, uh, that is made uh, but will eventually require the um, approval or um, uh, by the city council, you know, based on the subject. Typically, there may be some monetary involvement or something that would require council action. An administrative order is one that allows the uh, executive branch to issue orders related to operations or anything that falls under the purview of the executive branch and does not require um, council action. My next question, thank you. My next question is, can any employee of the city advise other employees or direct other employees not to follow the laws of the city of Atlanta? They can, but it's not, I mean, it's not the kind of thing that, that should be encouraged. Um, I wouldn't think that an, an employee would encourage uh, the, the um, 
acting contrary to city ordinance, city code, or any city, state, federal law. If an employee of the city of Atlanta directs or advises or encourages employees not to follow the law, is that in of itself a violation of the law? Is it a violation of the ethics code or uh, professional standards, or, you know, what, or so forth? I'd have to have more details. I don't think it would be prudent of me to give a general answer, but there are occasions where such a direction would be a violation of law or possibly the ethics code or possibly some, you know, applicable regulation, but the facts would determine that. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Hey, well, I have a question on that. Okay. Mr. Hill, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Madam City Attorney. Um, not really a question at first, but just a comment. Just wanted to thank you uh, and Mr. Uh, Jonathan Futra on the in your department for working diligently on the North and Southern Chattahoochee brick issue. I'm glad to it's come to this point. Um, I'm very happy with that result. Uh, that, that, of course, a lot of work went in, went to, I know we've been, been speaking for the past few months, but um, our work is certainly not done. It's still in Lincoln Terminal's hands, and I look forward to having further conversations with, with your department and with planning as to how uh, the city moves forward in this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holt. I too congratulate you on that win. That was great. And I know Mr. Hillis is it's a I'm glad we won it. Bottom line is hooray, hooray. Let's move on now to um claims of favorable and unfavorable recommendations as a funded consent agenda. We will start with a uh, favorable recommendations and those are items okay, I lost my sheet. Those are items one through ten. Can I get a motion to accept items one through ten as favorable? So moved. I'll second. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. One moment, Madam Chair. The vote is open. Mr. Hillis, I believe that's both. Okay. Everyone, please vote. Mr. Faroki. Are we there, Ms. Linda? Yes, one moment. Mr. Hillis, I believe you were voice voting, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yay. That's six days there are nays. Those items are favorable, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We're not at items 11 through 38. These are claims with unfavorable. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. One moment. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Everyone, please vote. Mr. Heller? Yes. Mr. Faroki? The vote is closed. At six days, there are names. Their bottoms have been adverse. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. 
We're now under our regular agenda, and we are ordinance for second read. Ms. Lindo, can you sound item number one? Yes, Madam Chair. This is ordinance 210107. This is ordinance by Council Members Andre Dickens and Joyce M. Shepard to amend the charter of the city of Atlanta, Georgia, 1996 Georgia Laws, page 469, adopted under and by virtue of the authority of the Municipal Home Rule Act of 1965, pursuant to a Georgia Code Section 3635-1, as amended by amending Part 1, Charter and Related Laws, Part A, Charter, Appendix 4, Citizen Review Board, Section 3, Appointment of Members, so as to designate the two youth servant organizations who shall each appoint a member to serve on the Atlanta Citizen Review Board, who shall be between the ages of 18 and 30 at the time of the appointment and for other purposes. Thank you. Do we have Mr. Reed here to speak on these papers today? Was he able to attend? He, he, he indicated he would, Madam Chair. I was um, yes. asked to check. Hello. Uh, Hello, this is Lee Reed. Hello, Mr. Reed. How are you? Can you just briefly explain the paper before we vote? Yes. Yes, thank you. Committee uh, Chair Shepard, uh, Lee Reed with the Atlanta Citizen Review Board. Um, the paper before you today is um, a recommendation from the board um, for organization Street Smart Youth Project and the, the Atlanta University Center Consortium um, to fill the seats for the, the two vacant seats for the um, 18 to 30 year olds on the Atlanta System Review Board. The board took charge of the um, solicitation for organizations to submit letters of interest from, the, from throughout the city, and uh, the board evaluated those letters that have received and made the recommendations based on the information they received from the organization and uh, their commitment in the community. So today we have this recommendation and we would like to uh, move forward. If you have any questions, I'll put them in the Thank you, Mr. Reed. Any questions? And how, well, how many how many members do we have as, as a collaboration? How many members do you do we have that's vacant on your board? Um, currently, we have these two seats that are vacant. We have um, APAB, two APAB members that were confirmed and approved last week, and they will be skilled sworn in, and then we will be full staff. We have three that will be coming up vacant in the next six to nine months. Um, so right now we're at full capacity with, with these addition of these. All right. Thank you. The motion is to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, we'll let Mr. Bond, uh, Mr. Bond, I think you were first. So we're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. Mr. Howard? I'm online now. I'm on my yet. The vote is closed. 68 there a name. That item is favorable. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We're now moving to resolution. I think uh -huh. we can take two through five as a block. Ms. Lindo, would you sound those, please? Yes, Madam Chair. Item number two is 21R 3195. This is a resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against the City of Atlanta in the matter of these acts. ATL in the amount of $40,000, authorizing the settlement, settlement amount to be charged to and paid from accounts herein, and authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the settlement and for other purposes. Item number three, 21R3196, a resolution by the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee 
authorized through the settlement of all claims against the city of Atlanta in the case of Valentina Zambrano versus the city of Atlanta, civil action file number listed herein in the amount of $7,750, authorizing said amount to be paid from accounts listed herein, and authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the total settlement amount and for other purposes. Item number four, 21R, 3197, the resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against the City of Atlanta in the case of Gina R. Bartlett versus City of Atlanta, civil action file number listed herein in the amount of $24,500, authorizing that amount to be paid from accounts listed herein and authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to distribute the total settlement amount and for other purposes. Item number five, 21R, 3198, the resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against the City of Atlanta in the case of Lauren Riggins versus City of Atlanta, civil action file number listed herein in the amount of $20,000, authorizing said amount to be paid from accounts listed herein, and authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to distribute this total settlement amount and for other purposes. Okay, we have those items before us, items two through five. Uh, I will entertain a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Sorry, I'll mix my, yeah, thank you. Mr. Bond, thank you. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. The vote is open, Madam Chair. <laughs> the vote is closed, six days, zero nays. Those items are favorable. Okay, we will now move to item number six. Ms. Lindo, could you sign, sign that, please? This is, yes, Madam Chair. This is Resolution 21R, 3199. This is a resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the mayor or a designee to exercise renewal number three of, of Cooperative Purchasing Agreement, FC 10018, Pioneer Technology Benchmark Case Management System, Maintenance and Support with Pioneer Technology Group, LLC, on behalf of the Municipal Court of Atlanta for a term of one year, effective April 11, 2021 through April 10, 2022, in an amount not to exceed $285,000, all funds shall be charged to and paid from accounts listed herein and for other purposes. Any questions? If not, motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. The vote is up, Madam Chair. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is favorable. All right. And now from the items up under hell, and there's nothing coming off the of hill. Is that correct, Ms. Lindo? From my understanding, Madam Chair. All right. The only announcement I have is that you all mark your calendar again for March the 4th. I want to thank everyone who's been on uh, to our work sessions on the Atlanta City Detention Center. Uh, and I believe we also had some tours. I'm going on a tour next week with a couple of my colleagues. And then on March the 4th, we're going to come back for more discussion with the mayor's office and executive branch in terms of our proposal for ACDC. So please mark your calendar for that. And that's at one o'clock, March the 4th at one o'clock, a work session. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else have any comments? Good meeting, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Smith, are you there? Great, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boone. I'm going to make the motion to adjourn. Second. All right. All in favor say aye. And I like to say thank you. Bye. All right. Good evening. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.